Do you ever just sit back and just actually have time to reflect on anything? Or? The sitting back aspect for me is when I go diving. It's just one of the most peaceful moments of my entire life on the hunt for amazing sharks. <sighs> not finding me in there. Oh, come on. No way. Seriously. <laughs> no chance. You're not finding You're me Australian, out. for fuck's sake. How can you be scared of sharks? You grew up with those things. Welcome to Hanakuma's Good Trouble, where we celebrate those who have the courage to disrupt the norm. I'm Nick Kyrgios, professional tennis player and your host. In each episode, we'll sit down with game changers who aren't afraid to rock the boat. We'll dig into their stories and the waves they've made in their worlds for the better. Welcome to Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios. I'm honored to welcome a good friend and culinary king, Gordon Ramsay. Armed not only with a chef's knife, but also a sharp wit. From his French culinary beginnings, he sliced through the norm, creating a recipe for success that equal parts ambition and artistry. His fiery dedication in pursuit of perfection has earned him not just the acclaim of critics, but the loyalty of food fans worldwide. Beyond the stovetops of Michelin-starred kitchens, he has a grocery list of reality TV shows, including Next Level Chef, the most watched cooking show in television history. Gordon, congrats on the opening of your latest restaurant, Lucky Cat, in Miami, and more importantly, the latest addition to the Ramsey family. What does good trouble mean to you? Mate, um, thank you, bud. Uh, really good to see you. Uh, good trouble. Um, it screams passion and hard work. Nothing was ever handed on a plate. Mm. And so I respect everything I've got, everything I do. I just keep it real, but real, solid real. Yep. Not bullshit real. So I guess a, a question that myself want to ask you because I've had my fair share of profanity and swear words and you know the intensity that you bring, um, you know how important is that into your profession? I think it's a industry language, and it's competitive. It's it's full on, and it's it's shit, <laughs> and so you have to work hard to get out the shit, and then when it's glorious, it's difficult to talk about because very few get there. But then when you hit rock bottom, you're on your ass. Yep. I never set out to have a foul mouth. Yep. I got brought up um, in multiple council estates um, and I had to stand strong uh, through adversity. And so your skin becomes thick and you, you, you form a character that's protective. And then as you build your family and you build your business, you become protective of everything you've got. Yes. And so in many ways, it looks slightly flippant, slightly arrogant, but it's not, it's just defense because you've taken so much shit to get where you have. Yeah, I know all sees, about that. Everyone sees the glory, but they've got no idea what it was like at the beginning. And that, that, that shapes you, that forms you, that, that gives you character. And that's healthy today because it's not that hard um, striving for perfection. You just got to stay on that line mm. and just, just work at it. Yep. And I've read that every culinary master makes a transition from cook to chef. So earlier in your career, when did you feel like you made that shift and was there anyone you kind of looked up to to make that transition? Yeah, I think it was about when I was 22 uh, years of age, uh, on my ass in the middle of Paris. Mm. I was dropped in the deep end. And the turning point for me was becoming French. You go to Helen back to understand what makes the French work so brilliantly. And where food's concerned, they were the... They gave birth to fine dining. They, mm. they, they put food on the map and so... There was this extraordinary moment in Paris, uh, literally a night before my 23rd birthday, and I got promoted. I was on that stove the next day, rubbing shoulders with the best of the very best, and the penny dropped. And I said to myself, I can do this. Shit, I've got this. And I knew my palate was trained. And I'd really literally sit there and get ingredients and close my eyes and just sort of taste and describe in my mind. My head chef was an absolute arsehole in such an amazing way because he was harder on me than anybody because yep. he saw potential. I guess I had the light bulb moment when I beat Nadal center court of Wimbledon. I was going to school. I mean, I didn't even know how good I was at that time. I was just playing because it was just like, I was entered in the tournament and then it happened. And then I saw this list of guys who had achieved what I achieved. It was like Federer, Andy Murray. And I was like, okay, maybe I've got to start taking this seriously. Maybe I've got to get up off the video games for six hours a day, actually eat, actually train. I yeah. was not athletically gifted. I was just a skinny 19 year old from Canberra. You're chef at that time was pushing you because he saw, I guess, you know, potential. Mm -hmm. You know, that was just my parents and I'm just so glad, you know, in hindsight. If it was just myself driven, I don't think I would have gotten the best out of myself. No, there's always a turning point. 
And then I was even more hungry when I knew I'd got it because yep. I wanted to come back and put that magic on a plate and it's still rife today. So I guess I'm kind of making that transition now where, you know, doing a lot more business aspect side of things, but you, you know, you've kind of already mastered you know, millions and millions of people following. How have you transitioned to being in the spotlight so much and how have you dealt with that? Yeah, God, it's a tough one, that one. Um, I didn't ask to be in the spotlight. Mm. Um, the career and that defining moment of that level of perfection, winning three Michelin stars and get to the very top, there's this spotlight and then all of a sudden, you know, you become one of the best restaurants in the world. Uh, you start off this tiny little neighborhood bistro, then mm. you get one star, then you get two star, all of a sudden you can't get in, it's fully booked for six months and mm. every Tom, Dick and Harry is desperate to get into your restaurant. Yep. And all of a sudden you win three stars. Man, then the shit hits the fan. Uh, then you're the biggest asshole uh, in the industry because uh, you're just cooking for stars. Mm. Man, you take so much shit from individuals that know so much less about food than you and the power of the pen and the computer and they're hiding behind their desk and yep. they're coming in and they're telling the world how shit your food is. Who in the fuck are they to tell yep. you how good you are? I think there's a saying, the customer's always right. But today with social media, everyone's just gonna say their two cents. What's your take on that? Mate, opinions are like arseholes. Everyone's got one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Phones are powerful and a dish can be taken and sent to the other side of the world within seconds. And so I welcome that intrusion. Are they always right? No, of course they're not. Depending on the level of alcohol they've had to drink, yeah. that's when they're right. But don't forget, they're paying the fucking check. Yeah, I guess with my Wimbledon experience, the critics, I mean, they always have their two cents. And when I, I was- I could hear them, because <laughs> we live next door to Wimbledon. We could hear the roar from the bedroom window. So I guess so. I was like, you know, as I was progressing through the tournament, I could tell like, you know, I think Piers Morgan was saying, you know, this is the worst thing to happen to Wimbledon, Kyrgios progressing through and all this garbage and all that type of stuff. But, you know, that was a big driver for me was trying to silence my critics. Cause I was like, if I actually somehow win Wimbledon, being who I am, I guess your tennis, you know, immortality. It's I'm, emotion though. It is. I think when you've made so many sacrifices to get where you have, then um, it's important to express how you feel. Otherwise, you never move on if you haven't dealt with it. And I need to deal with it verbally because I, I can't harbor mistakes. That, that's the inner, perfectionist in me. Do you feel like people have now understood more so how you are and just embraced you for who you are, like the passion and just been like, okay, maybe he's not gonna change, but we like who he is now more. Cause I feel like now in my career, I actually go around the world and the stadiums are full and they're like, okay, he's not gonna change. This is why we're actually coming to see him because he's, you he might do something insane or he might do something we've never seen before. There's something about a gentleman um, that is unpredictable um, and a glamorous, uh, disruptive individual. It's healthy today. I get people that know who I am. Mm. And so you actually get less shit because you're the real person, yep. as opposed to someone smarming and kissing your ass. I can't stand that stuff. Mm. And so let me strive for perfection. Let me perfect my craft. And then we're up against it with the sort of new age of the industry in a way that you shouldn't talk to people like that and you shouldn't be that firm on them. Well, if you're not prepared to take a risk, you're not gonna get anywhere. Mm. And they need to understand that there's consequences when we fuck up. And if I fuck up tomorrow in my kitchen, there are consequences. And I have to deal with those consequences. Um, I don't blame anybody else. I take full responsibility. Mm. So as a fan, I watch Kitchen Nightmares. I series. wanted to come on one of those shows one day where there's come undercover as a guest or a diner. I would fucking wet myself in seeing you stand there chopping veg <laughs> undercover uh, and no one knowing who you are. We'll get a big beard, get a big chef's hat. I'm It'd be very hard to hide you in a fucking kitchen, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I know, I stand out like a sore thumb. But has any of like, when you've gone in Kitchen Nightmares, have you gone to any of these places and then you learn from any place and be like, shit, let's just tidy it back up with what I've got going on. Have you learned or is it like, you know, lit up a problem for you and be like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, cross my eye, like cross my T's and dot my eyes. I take this stuff so seriously. Customers vote with their feet. And so mm. um, when I started Kitchen Nightmares, I knew it was a double-edged sword because when they're successful and, you know, this business thrives, you don't get praise. Yeah. When they close and it fails, it's your fault. You get the fucking blame. I'm fucked either way. So um, I, absolutely throw everything into it to make these places successful. And so everything I've learned, everything I know, everything I'm doing, everything I'm doing in my business mm -hmm. comes into their business free of charge. If they don't take that prescription, um, they're not mm -hmm. gonna make it. It's mm -hmm. too competitive, Nick. The business is volatile. 78% mm -hmm. of the restaurants close in the first 15 months. Wow. And then I get fed up with people who are in love with the idea of running a restaurant. It is not fucking glamorous. And that 
stupid dinner party that took place six months ago and said, hey, Bill, you should buy a restaurant. This food's fucking amazing. I'm like, listen, <laughs> fuck face. That's one dinner out of seven nights a week. What do you mean? Do you have any idea what it's like doing yeah. that? Lunch Every and dinner, day, yeah. seven days a week, 365 days a year, yeah. paying a lease, paying rates. And then every ounce of ingredient that comes into that restaurant, you have to make glamorous, outsmart your competition, pay your staff brilliant salaries, make sure they don't work over 45 hours a week, and then make a profit. Uh, no. Bill and Mary, stop doing those fucking dinner parties and fucking call Uber Eats. So not many people know that you're a runner and, you know, a very competitive runner at that. How important is it to maintain that aspect of things whilst you're, you know, probably the best chef in the world? Keeping fit um, gives you the balance. I'm 57 years of age and uh, I feel 37. Um, I trained this morning at half past four. Just that time alone is beautiful. I've got a six hour bike ride set up for tomorrow morning in the wow. Santa Monica mountains. I'll be in the car by six and I'll be on the bike by seven. And so that level of fitness creates a wonderful balance yep. and it stops me getting sucked in. Keeping fit is a way of relaxing in a crazy way because it gives you such rejuvenated energy and I, I thrive on staying healthy. What specifically did sport help you with as you were rising through? So 23 year old, nothing, and then you started realizing you were ticking some boxes and then what about sport helped you through that? Yeah, in many ways it's the dressing room saga and you know, in the tennis world, it, you're so individual. Yeah. And so you are so blinkered in many ways. I have to drive a team and um, a restaurant called Ramsey in Chelsea, there's 25 chefs there. And so I brought that spirit from the dressing room and that sporting prowess mm. and that discipline and that respect and getting the best out of everybody into the kitchen. And so I like that balance of that sporting background come into the discipline of, of, of restaurants because it needs, it needs that drive. It needs that captain leadership mentality. And I quite like it when we're on the back foot. I like it when we're you know, on our ass. Mm. I like it when we're the underdogs. It's a really healthy position to be in. An underdog is healthy. Interesting thing, well, the thing about tennis is like, everyone thinks it's individual, right? But then it's like, we shower, like all the athletes shower together, we eat together. So we're seeing these people like minutes before we walk out to the arena, right. which is the craziest thing in sport. Like usually separate locker rooms, you don't see this person all day, you're trying to kill this person. Yeah, so for instance, last year at US Open, um, me and Medvedev are about to go out there and we're just in the locker room together watching the previous match finishes and we're just getting our stuff together and then we go play. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then we just comes right back into the locker room, getting undressed, shower, and then we're the only two people in the locker room and I just got to see this person all day. So it's wow. like, it's all, not a team environment, but it feels like you, you're doing the same thing because it's like, I'm just played in front of millions of people against this guy for hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars and now I got to shower next to him. Against each other. It's so hard to find that balance where you know, I understand, I've always been a team environment guy, I love basketball, love soccer, all that type of stuff, but tennis is so crazy like that, it's hard to like get an edge. I never knew that. I always thought you see each other for the first time. No. Separate dressing room, just like soccer. Spent hours where... and hours together. Wow. I was talking to his coach before wow. he walked out there. Wow. So I'm just thinking about all these coaches telling me oh, you got to play this certain way or you got to cook this certain way. Where did you realise that you had an instinct where you were like, okay, I think I know, mm -hmm. I'm where am I going to put my spin on things? Because for me, I, st I stopped listening to coaches pretty much immediately. Yeah. Like when did you know that your cooking style and something in here was a yeah. bit more advanced than what they were telling you? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I went to work for a guy called Guy Savoir in Paris. He was a two missing star chef. And mm. when you're working with a chef that's going from two to three, it's the best move because it's the final sort of uh, celebration. They wanted to keep me there because I was a big part of his team, but I wanted to break away and do my own stuff. And so I got back to London and literally three years later, I'd won my third mission star mm. before him. Oh, wow. And I got the call from him and he was speaking to me in French <laughs> and he was screaming and shouting and just, he was so excited because I knew that magic he'd given me. I then had to sort of bring the shutter down, turn my back on him and then then forged my own style. It was, uh, I very rarely cry at that night when we got told in the forthcoming guide, um, you've been awarded your third Michelin star. Well. I just said, uh, I just melted and sort of dis dissipated into this sofa and just like, holy shit. Uh, right, we've done it. I can't get any higher. Mm. I can't go any further. We, we can't get any better. Now we're going to fucking maintain it. And so this year we celebrate 25 years at Rest and Gordon Ramsay and we're gonna be 20, 
three years wow. at three Michelin star. So, yeah. Do you ever just sit back and just actually have time to reflect on anything? Or? The sitting back aspect for me is when I go diving. It's just one of the most peaceful moments of my entire life, diving. A 35, 40 meter dive and uh, on the hunt for amazing sharks. <sighs> not finding me in there. Oh, come on. No way. Seriously. <laughs> no chance. You're not finding You're me Australian out. for fuck's sake. How can you be scared of sharks? You grew up with those things. You sunbathe. What, are you acting the... like I spent time with one of them? I've never, no, I've never seen it's one in your before back my... garden. No. Great whites are your mates. I'm leaving that to you. You move like a great white on the court. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's shit scared of you. <laughs> So, I mean, transitioning from the kitchen to the television, you always, you, to me, you seem like a confident person. I feel like you can't get this far without really staying true to yourself. Did you ever have doubt that you were going to be, you know, good at what you do on, t on telly? Oh, God, it's a tough one, that one, because the first ever tele television experience was um, Kitchen Nightmares, this tiny little documentary you know, that we launched back in the UK on Channel 4. Mm. Prior to that, I was a judge on MasterChef, uh, in the old MasterChef. And so, it's funny, isn't it, because when you put, yourself into that environment if you were to go in and teach you know a group of young kids you know how to serve mm. and you've got 10 days to do it the difference over those 10 days would be night and day yeah and that's exactly what kitchen nightmares did i just got brought out of this three mission star sort of halo bubble go into a tiny shithole in the middle of lancashire and and fix their restaurant it's easy pickings it really easy stuff and so I could relate to that because I started with the Caesar salads and the braised oxtail um, and the sort of mackerel salad, uh, the chicken wing. I did all that stuff. Mm. I didn't get to the top by jumping there. Yep. I started in the dregs. And so I can relate to this idiot with too much garlic in the Caesar salad. I could relate to why the dressing's not taking the salad because it's fucking soaking wet. Uh, the shepherd's pie, he was making it with beef. Hello, shepherd, lamb, you fucking donut. <laughs> it's called shepherd's pie because they guard their lamb. What the fuck are you doing putting beef in the shepherd's pie? <laughs> How on earth is that a shepherd's pie? Shepherds look after fucking sheep, not cows. <laughs> I mean, and so that stuff for me was uh, easy. And then all of a sudden, I think the viewer found it fascinating that this individual was calling it as it was. And, and, and it never changed. But yeah, I enjoy TV, I, I, especially when it's live. Yeah. Because it's, it's me. Yeah, um, to you, it's real. Very real. Have you ever gone onto a Kitchen Nightmares and feel like you've absolutely crush someone's soul. There are moments there where I've gone too far, where I thought, mm, God, was that justified? Um, and it's not until the next day, if I made a mistake, I'll own it. I'll, I'll, I'll be yep. accountable for that. And I'm, I'm not that up my own ass that I can never apologize. Um, in the heat of the moment, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an expression that when someone's not listening, it's bloody frustrating. So you have to remember, they've asked me in. I don't just fucking rock up and get out my car with a camera on my shoulder and say, hey, my name's Gordon, I'm here to fix your restaurant. They are begging for help. Yep. And so um, I've never gone that far where I've thought, right, I've overdone it. I've definitely done it to the right person because mm. they've deserved it. And when they've been that ignorant and blatantly ignoring the advice they're given, uh, it's bloody frustrating because it's just a waste of fucking time, a waste of money, a yep. waste of time. You've said it though, it's just passion. Like when I get angry on the court, I'm not doing it because I'm mad at someone else. I'm just upset because I know that I can do better. Mm -hmm. So that's why I never understood when I was watching all these shows of yours, Kitchen Nightmares, like they've begged you to come in and make changes. It's not like, yeah. and, uh, and some of these people are like, oh, we just wanted you here to, to okay our food. And it's just like, yeah. no, you, you came in to make massive changes. But for me, when I take it too far, in tennis world, like swearing, for instance, is, is frowned upon in the tennis world. I don't even think I do take it too far at times. Obviously, if I smash a racket, yeah, whatever for the youth to, that are looking up, but it's just passion at the end of the day. Like you go into these restaurants and you care for their well-being, like their financial well-being or you know the way they're moving forward. For me, I'm just trying to get the best out of myself. Yeah. But I never understand people that say that, oh, he's taking it too far. It's like, I'm just passionate about what I do. Yeah. Like the, hours and hours on end, the years that I put into this, and mm -hmm. I'm not playing the way I want to be playing. Yeah. No, I can relate to that. Unfortunately, those rackets break today so easily, yeah. and yeah, they're exactly so fine-tuned. The they're not like they were, you know, 10 years ago. But if you were to mic up any professional soccer player yeah. and listen to the speech across those 90 minutes Vulgar. in the game, uh, extraordinary. <laughs> and, I mean, absolutely extraordinary. And so it is an industry language, and it, is, it needs to be dealt with, and you can't, hey, please be so kind, not to act like an idiot and put beef in the shepherd's pie and charge customers a lot of money for frozen food. And so we're dealing with people's livelihoods here. Yep. There's a lot on the line. And so, yeah, I have pushed it. It's because you care. 
Yeah, and they push me, by the way. Yeah, and so I've this is a two-way. This is a two-way thing. Amy's Baking Company. That is know, hilarious. By she the way. she she still gives me fucking nightmares today. Every time I see a cat, I think of Amy's Baking Company. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And uh, I just think ABC. Taking tips, are, taking tips from the waiters. Oh, part. my God. And all the fakery about all these desserts she was making that she was finishing off. She didn't make those things. And then we found all the gnocchi that was freshly made on the menu at $25. And this stuff was had a shelf life to fucking 2032. Uh, and it didn't even go to the fridge. And so I don't like cheating. Mm. I don't like cheats in restaurants. I don't like people pulling the, the wool over customers' eyes. Um, they, they pay good money to eat good food. They deserve the best. other chefs that you see up and coming, where can they maybe do things that you hadn't? Or how can they be different? Like, what, what would your advice be for those kind of chefs? Yeah, I, I have a very unselfish uh, look on that. We, we, we set up an academy uh, five years ago. And mm -hmm. so what's going through the academy now in London is extraordinary. And um, in many ways, I get frustrated when these young kids come into the industry and they're sandbagged with huge culinary fees. And so they come out of the industry, they've got $200,000 worth of debt because they've been in a culinary school and then they can't take the job they need for experience because they've got to take a job to rid the debt. Yep. And so they're sandbagged. So we've come up with a really nice, smart way of giving these kids one week, two week intense courses, giving them such good skills to learning, you know, a dozen dishes rather than the massive repertoire, get them into a business so they can educate themselves with the knowledge as opposed to trying to get a job to get rid of the debt. And that is really important for me now to start demystifying this three, four year culinary school, mm. mother sources. No one gives a fuck about a hollandaise made in the 1980s. Mm. There's a modern way of cooking and my job now is to inspire that new generation and sandbag them less and give them the tools they need earlier on. Do you feel as if your passion for cooking has died down in any way? For me personally, like possibly is lowered a little bit with you. Do you still have that fire and the passion for cooking as you know, when you once started? And how, if so, what do you put that down to? Yeah, good question. Um, God, I'm, I'm grateful for what we've got. But I also understand that level of succession, the sort of base camp, Russian Gordon Ramsay, the talent that we, we breed in there. Mm. If I was still in there, hands on and filleting every fish and, you know, cleaning every plate, I'd be a one man band and probably would have died 10 years ago as a heart attack. So you've got to let go and you've got to find that balance to get creative, plan succession and then find other things in your life that for, fulfills what you can't get from that daily service. So I'm lucky because I go into Hell's Kitchen and it's like the first six months of opening restaurant Gordon Ramsay. It is competitive, it's full on, mm -hmm. the restaurant's fully booked and I'm dealing with some newbies that haven't quite got up to speed. And that's a culinary boot camp. So I'm lucky I get to dip into these things yep. that keeps that flame burning. Right. And then watching new talent grow. And I'm sure it's with you, with young tennis players. Yep. You can't teach everybody. But that small percentage you can, they do make a difference. And that, that's been part of my succession over the last 15 years. Yeah, I guess that's different for me because I can't, I guess, coach someone whilst I'm still playing no. in a sense. But that's what you, you've kind of been mast, like mastered your thing, yeah. helping others and then continually like learning and, and doing yeah. your own thing. It's I'm very lucky that my life can flip so quickly. I'm putting gas in the tank still. I don't know how long I can do it for, Nick, if I'm honest, but yep. uh, I'm certainly not anywhere near giving up. So what is it for you that actually defines a chef? Discipline. Discipline and we're there to please others. You go on that court and you've got, you know, 20,000 people watching you. The personal ambition is there, but you want to leave them with a good game. It's exactly the same coming into a restaurant. It's live and um, you've got a three-hour experience of getting customers to experience perfection that will last a lifetime. Mm. There's decades of work going in to that eight minute devouring your appetizer, 12 minute devouring your main course and then that dessert arrives. And so that's the legacy that I'd like, continuing to give people that pleasure. You know, I'm not gonna ask you, is there anything that you regret saying? You know, was there a particular moment where you didn't say something that you really wanted to say? Like, do you regret not saying something to Mate. anyone? Mate, my mum gives me a stern reminder of the shit I've done. Uh, I kicked out a food critic once. Uh, he was being a, an absolute dick. Uh, and the headline in the, in the press at the time was the failed soccer player that had a shotgun wedding. Uh, we went through a horrendous uh, miscarriage. And for any family, young lady, it was a, it was a traumatic time. Mm. And so 
they start judging the character of the family, and all I wanted was just just just, just my food. Don't. Yep. And so when he turned back up, he came with Joan Collins, and you know I kicked him out, but she was a guest, and so I regretted that. And my mum said, "How dare you ever kick Joan Collins?" I said, "Mum, I didn't really mean to kick her out. She was just a guest of this dick." And so um, I apologise. But I know I've said some pretty strong things, um, and is in the heat of the moment. Um, but it's not personal; it's professional. Mm. So with my mentoring, you know, I try and help some players here or there. You know, I've got some professional players in my DMs all the time, like ask me for tactical things, and I'm very happy to help. And I don't really tell them, you know, don't do this. But is there a particular thing that you would tell other chefs never to do? You know, climbing through the culinary ranks. So what's like a key rule that you would tell someone never to do? Uh, well, first of all, pressure is healthy. Uh, bring that pressure on, and, and learn to dance in the storm. Everyone shits themselves, went, oh God, it's gonna be a mess, it's gonna be so much pressure, it's gonna be you know, uh, an environment that I'm not really used to. No, learn to dance in the storm, because it fucking passes. And I'm old enough and wise enough to have seen many storms come, and many people shit themselves around you, thinking, oh my God, I can't believe we fucked up, this is gonna be horrendous, the press is gonna get hold of it. It blows over. So stand strong in the storm, and enjoy that moment. And don't be scared of silence. A lot of chefs worry about that moment when customers are silent and there's nothing happening. Yeah, they're devouring, they're enjoying it. And so uh, I push them into that pressurized zone because it's healthy. Mm. Pressure's healthy, provided you can sustain it. Well, thank you, Gordon. That wraps up another episode of Good Trouble. I appreciate your time and best of luck with everything. Thank you, bud. And I can't wait to um, film in the next Kitchen Nightmares and you're fucking standing there on the fish section like this amazing young chef that's hungry to climb the ladder. I appreciate it. Thanks, bud. Thank you. Thanks for watching. For more Hanakuma's Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe.